Hello class and welcome to the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured Chapter 22 Psychiatric Emergencies Lecture. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will be able to recognize behaviors that pose a risk to the MT, patient, or others and understand the basic principles of the mental health system. Additionally, students will have the knowledge and skills to successfully assess and manage patients experiencing a psychiatric emergency within the legal parameters of their scope of practice. And we're going to discuss um, uh, associated with psychiatric uh, recognition of behaviors that pose a risk, um, basic principles of the mental health system, assessment, acute psychosis, suicidal risk, and agitated delirium. Okay, so as an introduction, EMTs often care for patients experiencing a behavioral risk um, or psychiatric emergency. So a behavioral crisis um, may result of uh, acute medical condition, a mental illness, a mind-altering substance, stress, and there are also many other causes. At some point, most people experience an emotional crisis. This does not mean that everyone develops mental illness. Otherwise, healthy people may sustain acute or temporary mental health disorders. Do not jump to any conclusion that a patient is mentally ill when exhibiting behaviors discussed in this chapter. The most common misconception about mental illness is that if you are feeling bad or depressed, you may be sick. So there are justifiable reasons for feeling depressed. Um, for an example, you could be going through a divorce or um, have a death of a re relative or friend. So many people believe that all individuals with mental health disorders are dangerous, violent, or otherwise unmanageable. Um, the truth is only a small percentage of patients with uh, mental health problems fall into those categories. So EMTs may be exposed to a higher portion, though, of violent patients because they are seeing people who are, by definition, considered to be having behavioral crisis. Communication is key. In most cases, patients will, um, they can be de-escalated um, when a level of trust is established. So although you cannot determine what uh, has caused a person's crisis, you may be able to predict whether um, the person will become violent. And so um, first let's start by defining a behavioral crisis. So behavior is what you see of a person's response to an environment, so to his or her actions. Most of the time, people respond to environment in reasonable ways. Over years, people learn to adapt to a variety of situations in daily life, including stress. Sometimes stress is so great that in normal ways of coping are not enough, or the person uses negative coping mechanisms, such as uh, withdrawal, drugs, or alcohol. Reactions to stress that are acute and those that develop over time can create a crisis. So the change in a behavior may be considered inappropriate or not normal by the person who calls 911. A behavioral crisis or psychiatric emergency includes patients of all ages who exhibit agitated, violent, or uncooperative behavior or who are in danger to themselves or others. EMS is called when the behavior becomes unacceptable to family, patient, or the community. A patient may have dementia or depression, which is a behavior that may interfere with activities of daily living, chronic depression, a persistent feeling of sadness or despair, may be a symptom of a mental health disorder. Usually, if any abnormal or disturbing pattern of behavior lasts for a month or longer, um, it is a matter of concern from a mental health standpoint. So when a psychiatric emergency arises, the patient may show agitation or violence and may become a threat to the self, to their self or others. The magnitude of mental health disorders is what we're going to talk about next. And so according to the National Institute of Mental Health, mental health disorders are common throughout the United States, affecting tens of millions of people each year. A psychiatric disorder is an illness with psychological or behavioral symptoms that may result in impaired functioning. 
Anxiety disorders are among the most common mental health disorders. They are generalized anxiety disorders, panic disorders, social and other phobias, post-traumatic stress disorders, or PTSD, or obsessive compulsive disorders. The U.S. mental health system provides many levels of assistance to people with psychological conditions. Professional counselors are available for marital conflicts and parental uh, parenting issues. More serious issues such as clinical depression are often handled by psychiatric psychologists. Some of the most psychological conditions such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder require psychiatrists to prescribe medication. Most psychological disorders can be handled through outpatient visits. So some people require hospitalization in specialized psychiatric units. Psychiatric disorders have many underlying causes, and so it could be caused from social or situational stress, such as divorce or death of a loved one, uh, diseases such as schizophrenia, physical illness such as diabetic emergencies, or chemical problems such as alcohol or drug use, or um, biological disturbances such as electrolyte imbalances. Sometimes these conditions are compounded by noncompliance with prescribed medications. Okay, so let's talk about the pathophysiology. So an EMT is not responsible for diagnosing the underlying cause of a behavioral crisis or a psychiatric emergency. So you should just um, understand two basic categories of diagnosis by a physician. So we're going to talk about organic, which is physical, uh, physical um, um, or functional, which is the psychological. So organic brain uh, disorders or organic disorders um, is a temporary or permanent dysfunction of the brain caused by a disturbance in a physical or psychiatric or psychological functioning of the brain tissue. And so um, a, a, a permanent dysfunction of the brain, uh, it could be caused by sudden illness, traumatic brain injuries, seizure disorders. Uh, drug or alcohol abuse, overdose or withdrawal, and diseases of the brain such as Alzheimer's disease or meningitis. So altered mental status can arise from hypoglycemia, hypoxia, impaired cerebral blood flow, um, hyperthermia or hypothermia, um, in the presence of a psychologic, um, a physiologic cause, um, Altered mental status may be the indicator of a psychiatric disorder, such as bipolar. Okay, so next we're going to talk about functional disorders. So a functional disorder is a psychological disorder that impairs bodily function when the body system may be structurally normal. So uh, such as like schizophrenia, anxiety, or depression. So the chemical or physical basis of these disorders does not alter the appearance of the patient. approach uh, safely to a behavioral crisis. So all regular EMT skills, um, such as patient approach, assessment, patient communication, obtaining history, and providing care are used in a behavioral crisis. Other management techniques are also involved. So follow the general guidelines to ensure your safety um, during a behavioral crisis or a psychiatric emergency. So assess the scene, ensure you have means of communication, know where the exits are, don your PPE, have a definitive plan of action, urgently try and de-escalate the patient's level of agitation, and calmly identify yourself. Also be direct, be prepared to spend extra time, stay with the patient, do not get too close to a potentially violent patient though. Um, express interest in their story, avoid fighting with the patient, be honest and reassuring, and uh, do not judge. Okay, so next we're just going to go through the patient assessment as we do with every um, chapter. And then we're going to start with the scene size up, of course. And the first thing that uh, you should consider is the scene safety and uh, the patient's response to their environment. So is the situation potentially dangerous for you or your partner? Do you need uh, to get law enforcement there? And should you stage until the law enforcement uh, has arrived? Does the patient's behavior seem typical? Um, and are there legal in 
uh, issues involved. Is this a crime scene? Do you need consent? Uh, are you, uh, do you need to obtain a refusal? So take appropriate standard precautions and request any additional resources that you may need. Okay, so we're looking for the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness. And um, so you need to note any medications or substances that may contribute to the complaint or that uh, may be um, treatment of uh, relevant medical condition. Okay, so primary assessment. So you need to form your general impression. You need to begin your assessment from the doorway or from a distance. So um, how does the patient appear? So begin with an introduction of who you are and let the patient know that you're there to help them. You need to perform a rapid physical exam. Look for trauma, especially head trauma. Uh, observe the patient closely. Use AVPU to check for alertness. Establish a rapport with the patient. And most medical or trauma situations will include a behavioral component. So treat the whole patient, the behavioral component, as well as the medical or on a traumatic injury. Okay, next you're going to do the airway and breathing. So if your patient is in physical distress, assess the airway to make sure uh, that it's patent and or patent and adequate. So evaluate the patient's breathing and obtain the rate and effort. Use pulse hawks if available and provide appropriate interventions based on your assessment finding. Next we're in the C, so circulation. Assess the pulse rate, rhythm, and quality. Evaluate for the presence of shock or bleeding and assess the patient's perfusion um, by evaluating the skin color temp condition. Also, cap refill. Okay, next is the D, so transport decision. Unless the patient is unstable from uh, a medical problem or trauma, prepare to spend some time with the patient. It may take time to gain the patient's trust. History taking. So investigate the chief complaint and obtain a sample history. Consider three major areas for possible contributors. So first, is the patient's central nervous system functioning properly? Are hallucinations or other drugs or alcohol a factor? And are significant life changes, symptoms, or illness um, involved? So sample history. You may be able to elicit information uh, not available from uh, available to the hospital staff. So ask uh, 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 treatments, hospitalizations, and medications related to behavioral problems. In geriatric patients, consider Alzheimer's disease and dementia as possible causes of abnormal behavior. Determine the patient's baseline mental status to treat to guide treatment and transport decisions. This information will also be extremely helpful to hospital personnel. Obtain information from relatives, friends, observers, and caregivers. Your assessment of the situation has two primarily, primary goals. So you want to recognize major life threats and reduce the stress of the situation as much as possible. Use reflective listening to gain insight into the patient's thinking. And reflective listening is when you repeat in question form what the patient has just said. This encourages the patient to expand on the thoughts. The table on the slide lists questions to ask when you're evaluating a mental health disorder. Okay, so let's talk about the secondary assessment. Physical examination so in an unconscious patient, you begin the physical exam uh, to look for reasons uh, for the unresponsiveness. You want to rule out trauma, especially on the head. Um, so conduct a detailed physical exam and obtain a complete set of vitals. Obtain vitals only um, if it is possible to do so without worsening the patient's emotional condition. So make every effort to assess blood pressure, pulse, and skin and pupils. So consider whether prior events such as a physical agitation, use of stimulants, alcohol withdrawal, or taser, taser exposure may be contributing to the patient's condition. When examining a patient with a behavioral emergency, check for track marks indicating drug abuse or for signs of self-mutilation. A conscious patient may not respond to your questions. 
You can tell a lot about a patient's emotional state from their facial expressions, pulse rate, respirations. Also, tears, swelling, blushing may also be a significant indicator of a state of mind. Look in the patient's eyes. A blink, a blink glaze or rapidly moving eyes may mean the patient is experiencing central nervous system dysfunction. Your transport decision. So when available, have law enforcement personnel or firefighters accompany you in the back of the ambulance during transport. There may be sufficient facility to which the patient with the psychiatric emergencies are transported. Um, a specific facility. So transport by ground rather than by air. Try to make the patient comfortable. Placing the stretcher in the Fowler's or high Fowler's position helps prevent aspiration and re reduces physical exertion. Never let your guard down. So many patients experiencing a behavioral crisis will act spontaneously. Be prepared to intervene quickly. If restraints are necessary, assess and document at the patient's respirations as well as pulse monitor and sensory function in all restrained extremities every five minutes. Your heart may go out to the emotionally distressed patient. There is often little you can do during transport this, in the short time um, you will be treating the patient. So your job is twofold, try and diffuse and control the situation and safely transport the patient to the hospital. Intervene only as much as it takes to accomplish these tasks. Be aware of standard precautions, and if you encounter a situation where you think a pharmacologic restraint might be necessary, request advanced life support as early as possible. Communication and documentation. Give the receiving hospital advance warning when a patient experiencing a psychiatric event is arriving. Because many hospitals need, they may require extra preparation to ensure that appropriate staff and rooms are available. Report whether restraints will be required when the patient arrives at the hospital. Communicate to the hospital the things you have observed at the scene that may help to explain the patient's situation, such as observed behaviors or medications. Document thoroughly and carefully. Yours may be the only documentation about the patient's distress. So psychiatric emergencies are fraught with legal dangers. So document everything that occurred on the call, particularly in situations that require restraints. If restraints are used, say which types and why they were used. Okay, next we're going to talk about acute psychosis. So psychosis is a state of delusion in which the person is out of the touch with reality. It's um, affects people, um, affected people live in their own realities of ideas and feelings. And causes of, um, of these episodes can be mind-altering substances, intense stress, delusional disorders, or schizophrenia. Some episodes last for brief periods, others last a lifetime. Schizophrenia is a complex disorder that is not easily defined or easily treated. Um, the typical onset occurs during early adulthood with symptoms becoming more prominent over time. So influences thought to contribute to this order are brain damage, genetics, or psychologic and social influences. Delusions and hallucinations and a lack of interest in pleasure, erotic speech are some of the symptoms of um, schizophrenia. Guidelines for dealing with them are determine the situation is dangerous, clearly identify yourself, be calm, direct, and straightforward, and maintain an emotional distance. Do not argue, explain what you're going to do, and involve people whom the patient trusts, such as family or friends, to gain the patient's cooperation. Next, we're going to talk about excited delirium. And so the definition of delirium is a condition of impairment in cognitive function that can present with disorientation, hallucinations, or disillusions. Agitation is a behavior characterized by restlessness and irregular physical activity. Although patients experiencing delirium are generally not dangerous, if they exhibit agitated behavior, they may strike out irrationally. So in some cases, your personal safety must be considered. Signs and symptoms of delirium are hyperactive, erratic um, behavior, behavior, 
vivid hallucinations, high blood pressure, high heart rate, diaphoresis, and dilated pupils. You need to be calm um, and uh, safely approach the patient. Uh, be active listener, nod, indicating that you understand, and listen uh, without interruptions of the patient's um, comments. So uh, approach the patient slowly and purposefully and respect the patient's personal space. Limit physical contact as much as possible. Do not leave the patient unattended. Use careful interviewing techniques to assess the patient's function. So try to directly determine if the patient is oriented, um, if they have a memory, uh, if they can concentrate, and uh, their judgment. So pay particular attention to the patient's ability to communicate clearly and make notes on the patient's apparent mood. Um, you need to pay attention to the patient's appearance, dress, and personal hygiene. Okay, so next we're going to talk about uh, if the patient appears to be experiencing an overdose, you need to take all the medication bottles or legal, illegal substances with you to the medical facility. The patient should be transported to the hospital with a psychiatric facility and whenever possible, refrain from using lights and sirens. The patient agitation continues, request advanced life support assistance so chemical restraints can be considered uncontrolled or poorly controlled uh, patient agitation can lead to sudden death from, they could have a severe or a sudden cardiopulmonary arrest, um, physical agitation thought to result from um, some type of metabolic acidosis, and physical control measures um, such as using tasers. So um, positional asphyxia is uh, when uh, it can occur when the patient's physical position restricts chest wall movement or causes airway obstructions. So pre-hospital patient restraints uh, reduce the possibility of patient injury and um, maybe EMS provider injury and it allows for safe and appropriate uh, treatment of the, the uncooperative patient. But uh, the National Association of Emergency Medical uh, Service Physicians recommends that every pre-hospital care provider uh, create and follow a pre-hospital patient restraint protocol. And so such protocols consider um, whether the, it's appropriate uh, to use restraints, the types of restraints, the care provided to the patient following the restraint. Your protocols must consider the laws of your state. So there's a wide variation in pre-hospital patient restraint protocols throughout the country. Um, and uh, so soft restraints can in include sheets or um, wristlets or chest harnesses. And hard restraints include plastic ties or handcuffs or leather restraints. So the method of restraint chosen should be the least restrictive method that will ensure the safety of the patient and the providers. The personnel must be properly trained in the use of restraints. So if you restrain a person without authority in a non-emergency situation, you could expose yourself to the possibility of lawsuit and to personal danger. So legal actions against you can involve several types of charges. So assault, battery, false imprisonment, and violation of civil rights. So you may use restraints only to protect yourself and others from bodily harm or to prevent the patient from injuring himself or herself. You may only use reasonable force as necessary to control the patient. So follow local protocols and your company's uh, pre-hospital restraint policy and consult medical control if needed. You should always involve law enforcement personnel if you are called to assist a patient in a severe behavioral crisis or psychiatric emergency. Law enforcement personnel will provide physical backup in managing the patient and serve as a necessary witness and legal authority. A patient who is restrained by law enforcement personnel is in their custody. Before you consider physical restraint, use non or use verbal de-escalation techniques to avoid the need for physical restraint. Consider asking the family to assist you in, a calm, in calming the patient and be honest or, and straightforward and talk in a calm and friendly tone.
the process of restraining the patient. So once the decision has been made to restrain the patient, you should carry it out quickly. Make sure you have adequate help to restrain the patient. Um, ideally, five people should be present to carry out the restraint. One personnel for each extremity and one uh, responsible for the head. Should be a team leader who directs the process and a plan of action before you begin and use the minimum force necessary to control and restrain the patient. The level of force will vary depending on the following factors. The degree of force that is necessary to keep the patient from injuring their self and others, and also the patient's size, sex, strength, and mental status, including the possibility of drug-induced state, the type of abnormal behavior the patient is exhibiting. You and your partner should talk to the patient throughout the process. Treat the patient with dignity and respect at all times. If possible, a provider of the same gender should attend to the patient. Wear appropriate barrier protection during the restraint process. Avoid direct eye contact and respect the patient's personal space until necessary. Never leave a restrained patient unattended. Four-point restraints, uh, which is both arms and legs, are preferred for uncooperative patients. Do not place anything over the patient's face, head, or neck. If the patient is spitting, a surgical mask may be placed loosely over the patient's mouth. If the patient attempts to bite, uh, a hard cervical collar may be placed on the patient's neck. Respiratory and circulatory problems have been known to occur in combative patients who are restrained. So monitor the patient for vomiting, airway obstruction, respiratory status, circulatory status, changes in the levels of consciousness. Reassess airway and breathing continuously and make uh, frequent checks on circulation. Restraints applied in the field should not be removed until the patient is evaluated at a receiving facility. So perform the patient restraint, follow the steps in skill drill 22-1 to implement a four-point restraint. A two-point restraint technique is an option if allowed per protocol. Once the patient has been restrained, reassess airway and breathing and document the information. The potentially violent patient, um, violent patients make up only a very small percentage of patients undergoing a behavioral or psychiatric crisis. However, the potential for violence is always a critical consideration for you as an EMT. Assess the level of danger based on the following factors. History. Has the patient previously exhibited hostile, overly aggressive, or violent behavior? The patient's posture. So how is the patient sitting or standing? Is the patient tense, rigid, or sitting on the edge of his or her seat? This scene, is the patient holding or near potentially lethal objects such as a gun, knife, glass, poker, or bat, or near a window or glass door? Um, vocal activity. So um, what kind of speech is the patient using? Is it loud, obscene, erratic, and bizarre speech patterns usually indicate emotional distress? Physical activity. The monitor activity of a person undergoing a psychiatric emergency may be the most telling factor of all. A patient requiring careful watching is one who has tense muscles such as clenched, clenched fists or glaring eyes, somebody who's pacing or cannot sit still, or is fiercely protecting their personal space. Other factors to consider is poor impulse control a history of fighting or uncontrollable temper, history of substance abuse, depression, which accounts for 20% of violence attacks, or functional disorder, uh, which is, is if a patient tells you voices are telling him or her to kill, um, believe it. Suicide. So depression is the single most significant factor that contributes to suicide. It is a common misconception that people who threaten suicide will never commit it. Suicide is a cry for help. Threatening suicide is an indication that someone is in a crisis and he or she cannot handle that alone. So immediate intervention is necessary. Be alert for warning signs. 
does the patient have an air of tearfulness, sadness, or despair, hopelessness that, that suggests depression? Does the patient avoid eye contact, speak slowly, or project a sense of vacancy? vacancy? Does the patient seem unable to control about the future or unable to talk about the future? Is there any suggestions of suicide? And does the patient have any specific plans related to death? The table on this slide lists the risk factors for suicide. Consider the following additional risk factors for suicide. Um, are there any unsafe objects in the patient's hands? Is the environment unsafe? Is there evidence of destructive behavior? Is there a uh, threat to the patient or others? Is there any underlying medical problem? Or are cultural, religious, or social beliefs promoting suicide? And has there been in trauma? Next, we're going to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder and returning combat veterans. So post-traumatic stress disorder occurs after exposure to or injury from a traumatic event. Um, some examples can include uh, sexual and physical assault, child abuse, or serious accidents. Also, um, natural disasters, war, loss of a loved one, or stressful life changes. So PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder, is not necessarily the result of one isolated or recent event. An estimated 7 to 8 percent of the general population will experience signs of PTSD at some point in their life. Military personnel who have experienced combat have a high incidence of PTSD. Reminders of their experiences in the military from news coverage or gatherings of veterans can also be triggers. Signs and symptoms of PTSD include feelings of helplessness, anxiety, anger, fear. People with PTSD may avoid things that remind them of trauma, including loud noises or smells, and sometimes avoid interactions with other people. They suffer constant nervous system arousal that is not easily suppressed. So heart rate increases, pupils dilate, and systolic blood pressures increase. Senses are sharpened and mental acuity is heightened. The patient may be hypervigilant or display an aggravated startle response to perceived danger. They can relive the traumatic event through intrusive thoughts or nightmares or even flashbacks. And disassociated PTSD occurs when a person attempts to find an escape from constant internal distress or a particularly disturbing event. Other psychological conditions such as personality disorders and increased function impairment can develop in individuals with this type of PTSD. Many veterans develop a host of adverse physical conditions, some from injuries from combat and sometimes from unfocused pain that is not associated with any specific body part. So combat veterans in particular may be more prone to early heart disease, higher incidence of type 2 diabetes, and loss of brain gray matter. Another consideration for the combat veteran is the higher incidence of traumatic brain injury, TBI, sustained from trauma secondary to the explosion of an improvised explosive device, or IED. Symptoms may go undiagnosed for several reasons. Similar, similar, similar to symptoms of PTSD, and the patient may downplay the symptoms. Healthcare providers should ex Eliminate excess noise, refrain from touching or doing anything to the veteran without an explanation, and keep their diesel equipment far away. So caring for a combat veteran. The returning combat veteran is a patient who will require a unique level of understanding, compassion, and specialized attention. Be careful how you phrase your questions. Use a calm, firm voice, but do not charge. Respect a vet veteran's personal space. 
limit the number of people involved or move to a private and quiet space and ask about suicidal intentions. Military personnel are trained to use weapons and are resourceful at improvising weapons. Be there, uh, ensure that there is nothing the patient can assess and use as a weapon. Physical restraint will not be effective with this population and may simply escalate the problem. So if necessary, try and calm the patient, uh, especially if there are safety concerns, chemical restraints administered by advanced life support should be considered. Medical legal considerations. So the medical and legal aspects of emergency care can become uh, complicated when the patient is undergoing a behavioral crisis or a psychiatric emergency. Legal problems are reduced when the patient consents to care. So gaining the patient's confidence is a critical task. Once you have determined that a patient is impaired mental capacity, you must decide whether he or she requires immediate medical care. So a patient in a mentally unstable condition may resist your attempt to provide care. Do not leave the patient alone. Doing so may result in harm to the patient and expose you to a civil action for abandonment or negligence. Request a law enforcement personnel to handle the patient. Next, we're going to talk about consent. So implied consent is assumed with a patient who is not mentally competent to grant consent. So consent matters are not always clear cut in psychiatric emergencies. If you are not sure, request the assistant of law, person, law enforcement personnel or guidance from medical control. Limited legal authority. So the EMT has limited legal authority to require or force a patient to undergo emergency medical care when no life-threatening emergency exists. You should be familiar with your state and local laws regarding these situations. A competent adult has the right to refuse treatment, even if life-saving care is involved. In psychiatric cases, a court of law would probably consider your actions in providing life-saving care to be appropriate. A patient who is in any way impaired may not be considered competent to refuse treatment or transport. Always maintain a high level um, of high index of suspicion regarding the patient's condition. Assume the worst and hope for the best. Err on the side of treatment and transport and carefully document the patient's statement and behavior to support your actions. Okay, so next is the review, um, and this is the conclusion for Chapter 22, Psychiatric Emergencies. Thank you for joining me today. I'll allow you to go over the review questions on your own.